coming. Uh, so this is um, one of the lectures as part of the normal nuclear physics and astrophysics uh, module lectures. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting to devote at least one lecture where the focus is not so much on the physics, but on a related aspect of the socio-political parts that, that involve nuclear physics. So um, I thought it's interesting to have at least one lecture like this. And I'm very pleased to be able to introduce you to Matthew, um, Matthew Mahovsky, uh, and he will give us a lecture on nuclear weapons and Iran. So Matthew is an expert in this field. He's a graduate of uh, King's College London, the War Studies Department. Um, he's also uh, an expert in the politics of the Middle East, having lived over there and worked over there. Uh, he lived in Qatar for, what, three years, was it? Uh, working for the Qatari government and also advising the UK government on various um, security related issues. So I will hand you over to, to Matthew. Um, so we just uh, just a, a couple of words. Uh, we look, if, if you have questions, um, it's probably best to save those to the end. I think we'll have about five or ten minutes set aside for questions if you do have any. Um, other than that, I will hand over to Matthew. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Risby, for having me here. Um, I'm glad to see you guys. Uh, I will start this lecture uh, basically by saying I'm not a physicist. So um, all that is going to be here is partially physics, partially security, partially Middle Eastern studies, partially things that are quite topical and might be of interest to you. Um, I will start by introducing uh, the nuclear fuel cycle, uh, uranium enrichment, then move on to uh, basic issues of nuclear weapons technology, um, a bit about nuclear forensics, uh, then I will touch on the NPT and IEA, IEA, IAEA, sorry, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, then I will talk about the history of the Iranian nuclear program and move on to uh, what we actually know about Iran's nuclearization as opposed to all the international accusations that are um, levied against Iran. Um, then I will talk a little bit about the preemptive strike, potential preemptive strike by either Israel or the US and the prospects for regional war. Um, and finally, I will try to answer the question, what happens the day after Iran becomes a nuclearized weapon state? Right, so um, how do we actually enrich uranium? First of all, uh, the enrichment process is uh, technologically quite difficult, challenging, and certainly very expensive. Uh, it is a process by which the percentage of fissile uranium in a sample naturally obtained is increased using several artificial uh, processes. Um, these processes rely mostly on the tiny mass difference between two isotopes of uranium-238 and 235. Um, it is interesting to know that the isotope 235 of uranium is uh, only 1.26% lighter than 238. Um, we have different grades of uranium. Uh, first of all, the natural uranium around 7 0.7% of enrichment. Then uh, there is the slightly enriched uranium uh, 235 uh, concentration of 0.9 to 2%. Um, it's the most commonly used, it's most commonly used as a substitute for natural uranium in heavy water reactors, and I will talk about heavy water reactors in a little while. Um, it is used as opposed to natural uranium uh, because it increases uh, the energy efficiency, it, redu it redu reduces the costs, and reduces uh, the amount of um, uh, the amount of waste that then needs to be managed. Uh, then uh, we have the low enriched uranium um, concentration lower than 20%. Uh, it constitutes uh, the core of uh, most civilian nuclear reactors. Uh, majority of current civilian nuclear reactors are what one would call light water reactors or pressurized water reactors. Um, they typically require between 3.5 and 5 percent. 
um, these are most used. And when it comes to Iran, uh, this is this is precisely the uh, the level of enrichment that Iran is at at the moment and is restricted to. Um, so at the moment, they're enriching to 19.75% of enrichment. Then we have the highly enriched uranium, and highly enriched uranium is um, it's a little bit more complicated. It's quite often very misrepresented in the media. Um, yes, it is true that highly enriched uranium above 20% can be used in nuclear weapons, but rarely is so. Uh, therefore, we call it uh, basically between 20 and 80%. Um, that's what we would call weapons usable grade. And over 80 and 80, 85%, depending on the sources one cites, uh, this is the uh, water, uh, weapons grade uranium uh, typically uh, constitutes the core of uh, the core of nuclear weapons at the moment. Um, there is one interesting thing to point out when it comes to uh, highly enriched uranium. Um, in July, June, sorry, this year, Iran made an argument issued um, that the commander of the Iranian Navy issued a statement that Iran looks at the potentiality of uh, developing um, naval propulsion devices. Um, why is it interesting? It is interesting because naval and marine propulsion devices are exempt from IEA safeguards. Uh, what it means, uh, at the moment, we have uh, not that many ships, but still uh, the Russians use it in one merchant cargo ship, uh, a number of um, nuclear icebreakers, and obviously um, marine and naval propulsion is used in submarines in the US, Russia, France, Germany, India. Um, yeah, that's it. So um, it's interesting because um, in order to operate those naval uh, propulsion devices, you need to have a highly enriched uranium between 40 and 80, 90 percent. Um, it is completely legal uh, to have the stocks of that uranium when you can prove it is for the naval propulsion device. But what it also, it, it is considered to be a great uh, proliferation threat because um, it's very easy to then convert that uranium into weapons-grade uranium, 90% uh, uh, enrichment. Um, in terms of the enrichment process, uh, I'll talk about uh, the, the main three techniques, uh, the diffusion technique, the centrifuge technique, and the laser technique. Uh, the first two are currently used commercially. The third one is still under development. It has started being developed in the 1990s. Uh, it hasn't been introduced into commercial use yet. Um, the fusion uh, techniques, uh, both gaseous and thermal, um, this is the enrichment technique that was used uh, all throughout uh, the Cold War. Um, extremely expensive, um, not very energy efficient. It creates uh, a great heat that in fact can be observed from satellites. Um, <clears throat> in fact, when one compares uh, the diffusion with centrifuge techniques, the centrifuge techniques requires 50 times less energy electricity um, than the uh, gaseous diffusion. It, when it comes to diffusion, it um, it converts, um, it, con it, it, it basically diffuses, um, it, again, it depends on the small uh, mass difference between 235 to 238. It goes through uh, a great number of diffusers, um, a very long process, uh, very obviously energy, if, uh, energy requires a lot of energy. The centrifuges, uh, the, it, it, it is based on the principle of centripetal force accelerating molecules uh, so that particles of different masses are physically separated uh, in a gradient 
along the radius of a rotating um, container. Both of these techniques require what one could call the cascading effect. Um, the difference between one could ask, what is the difference between enriching uranium to 5% and enriching uranium to 50% and enriching uranium to 90%? Uh, unfortunately, when it comes to uh, nuclear security experts and the IEA, it becomes really difficult because actually there is not very much difference. It's only the, the only difference is how long you enrich it for, how many cascades you have um, for your use in enrichment. And finally, laser separation, again, as I said, not, laser, not licensed for commercial use, um, offers arguably still uh, greater energy efficiency and lower capital costs. Um, when it comes to nuclear weapons technology, uh, I'll talk about two most common designs, the gun type design and the implosion device uh, design. In the gun type, uh, you've got two masses of uh, enriched uranium. Um, the conventional explosive <coughs> creates, uh, it, it, it basically provides the initiation for the chain reaction. One uh, subcritical mass of uranium hits the other critical, subcritical mass of uh, uranium and then creates a supercritical mass. Um, this is the. This is exactly what uh, the little boy uh, bomb uh, that was used in Hiroshima was. Uh, the implosion device, uh, implosion type design. It's the. It's what Fatman uh, bomb was that was used in Nagasaki. Um, here, the subcritical fissile material is surrounded by explosives. The explosives. These explosives. Explosives provide initi initiation device. Uh, the, the, the 238 uranium isotope is then squashed, and then finally uh, the plutonium 239 that is in the middle in the core explodes. Um, implosion devices are mostly uh, fission fusion bombs, um, and this is pretty much uh, what is most used today. Um, difference between the gun type and the implosion when it comes to efficiency. Uh, in the gun type design, it was only about 1% of uh, fissile material uh, that went into chain reaction. Um, the rest was sort of scattered uselessly. So there is a great effic efficiency difference between the two. Uh, one could also, when it comes to nuclear weapons, what one could also differentiate between what we call strategic nuclear weapons and tactical nuclear weapons. Strategic nuclear, nuclear weapons are those that you know we are mostly afraid of, the, uh, the big bombs uh, that hit uh, large populations. Tactical nuclear weapons are used uh, much more frequently, uh, are used in the uh, battlefield. Um, they're part of uh, warheads of uh, various missiles. Um, for instance, the, uh, the American uh, super bunker Buster uh, bombs. Um, how do we look for um, how do we look for nuclear weapons programs? Um, extremely difficult. Um, very difficult to prove that someone does have a nuclear program. I suppose Iran is the the, the principal example. What do you look for? You look for uh, masses of. Uh, Ground that was that is being moved. You look for um, projects requiring um, high high quality um, metals, high grade steel and components. Uh, you obviously can um, do tests of uh, contamination. Um, you look for the for the seismic data, um, see whether there might have been any underground explosions. Um, but also, when it comes to obviously enrichment, uh, you look for the heat dissipation. Um, that's very, very easy to spot, obviously. Um, heavy construction work. Um, this, is, this is precisely the heavy construction work is precisely what the IEA is mostly looking at when it comes to Iran, because there is so little that they can actually prove. Uh, they look at what is being built 
where it is being built. Um, so what is IEA? IEA, uh, International Atomic Energy uh, Agency, um, created in uh, the 60s. It was uh, created. It was created outside of the uh, the UN. Many people would think it's part of the. It's a UN agency. It actually isn't. However, it does report to the uh, United Nations Security Council and the United Nations uh, General Assembly. It's got three major uh, missions uh, to safeguard and uh, make sure that there is no proliferation happening. Uh, but the first mission, and it's very very important, and it's actually the beginning of, uh, of IEA. The beginning came from Atoms for Peace. And Atoms for Peace is uh, precisely the program that was started uh, in, in the famous um, speech by Dwight Eisenhower uh, at the General Assembly. Uh, he then obviously called for, it was um, pretty much at the uh, post-Second World War, uh, he recognized that uh, nuclear energy can and should be used for peaceful uh, purposes, and he actually saw uh, nuclear energy to be uh, uh, a way forward for the for the entire globe. Um, and IEA is meant to provide uh, also uh, technology and um, knowledge, know-how to um, to states uh, worldwide that want to engage in civilian uh, nuclear power uh, programs, um, and you also ensure the safety. So um, you, they, they, they obviously uh, monitor uh, nuclear uh, programs all around the world, uh, making sure that they, uh, making sure that they basically uh, are of uh, good enough, good enough quality, and um, stick to um, legis international legislation that is out there. Um, IEA um, created comprehensive safeguards agreement and later on introduced also additional protocols. Uh, both are uh, what one could call international treaties entered into voluntarily by state. Um, <clears throat> they allow the IEA for the inspection of uh, nuclear sites. Up till 1992, uh, every nuclear um, well, both nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states, but basically all states that do have nuclear programs, were required uh, by that piece of legislation to um, to let the IEA know six months prior to introducing uh, any uh, radioactive material into their sites. Uh, Post-1992, there's been a bit of a difference there. Uh, there is no need for, uh, I mean, there, there's not only six months that is required, uh, but states are required to let the IEA know about any designs, any new techniques, right at the very start, right at the, right at the time of, the, of designing um, technology. Um, Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, what, what, what we normally uh, would call NPT, or uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty, um, <clears throat> deals with exactly this dual use of nuclear energy. And it's, it's precisely the dual use that creates legally, politically, and, insec and security-wise great, great problems. Uh, again, started, so the idea comes from uh, Dwight Eisenhower and the Atoms for Peace. It is certainly uh, one of fundamental pieces of international legislation. It is one of the most uh, worldwide adhered to treaties. We have only three member states, well, three states, that, three UN member states that do not uh, adhere to um, the NPT treaty. Um, that's Israel, India, and Pakistan. And we have one state that withdrew from the NPT. Uh, that's North Korea. Uh, some, uh, when it comes to Iran, um, some experts argue that Iran might perhaps consider withdrawing um, from, from the treaty as well. Um, is it feasible? In my opinion, no. Uh, why? Uh, one way, what happens when you withdraw from the NPT, one of the requirements is you return all the technology and fissile material that you acquired from overseas. 
um, when it comes to Iran, obviously most of that material comes from overseas. It's not very feasible for Iran to withdraw from the NPT. Plus, withdrawing from the NPT would mean that it would increase uh, the instability in the region, it would obviously increase uh, the lack of trust uh, towards Iran. So I don't think actually it is really uh, in the interest of Iran. Um, at the very moment, uh, with the problem of Iran, um, many, many, many people argue, well, what is the, what is the efficiency of, in, of the NPT? Why do we still have it? Um, it is true, the NPT is in a massive decline. Um, there are major, major problems with it. Um, first of all, one could, uh, the, the, the most apparent problem is that when it was introduced, it was meant to be introduced for uh, 25 years. It was not meant to be a permanent uh, piece of legislation. It was uh, meant to be exactly what uh, other pieces of legislation uh, that were uh, introduced for chemical, biological weapons there, and all of those chemical and biological weapons then were trans uh, well, were became um, complete bans on use of chemical weapons, complete bans on use of uh, biological weapons. Well, we way, way um, away from uh, a complete um, even test ban, um, a nuclear test ban treaty, uh, let alone complete, um, you know, um, end of the uh, nuclear weapons programs all around the world. I've got one question for you. What, in your opinion, uh, does anybody know what are the three fundamental pillars of the NPT? In, in other ways, uh, what was the NPT trying to achieve? ideas? Okay, um, so yes, that's one, trying to prevent nuclear proliferation. So not necessarily use, but nuclear proliferation, yes. So that's one. Any further ideas? So the first, first one was uh, the encouragement of the peaceful use. Um, the second one uh, was the prevention of proliferation. And the third one is the disarmament of existing stockpiles. When it was introduced um, in 1968 and then signed in 1970, it was first introduced as a draft, identical drafts, two identical drafts by one, the US, and second, the USSR. And those identical drafts lacked the third pillar. And that's, um, that's one of the arguments that, is, that has been forever put forward that one of the, way, one of the reason, reasons for uh, the NPT's failure is that it doesn't really uh, lead to that disarmament. Over the past uh, 40, 60, 40, 50 years, disarmament both in the USSR, then Russia and the US is still not very efficient at all. It was introduced, it was only introduced uh, because it was lobbied by mostly third world states uh, who then said, well, okay, um, if we either don't proliferate, well, if we don't proliferate, you've got to disarm. And uh, USSR and, and USA was not very, very happy about that, but uh, they then eventually um, eventually agreed to it. At the bottom of that slide, I've got one um, quote from the Article 4.1 of the treaty. Nothing in this treaty shall be interpreted, interpreted as affecting the inalienable right of all, all the parties to the treaty to develop research, production, and use of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. When it comes to Iran, it's this, this is one of the most interesting bits of legislation. Why, as we, as you may know, Iran has been sanctioned by the United Nations Security Council for its enrichment processes. The response from Iran is, well, you can't really sanction us because we have the inalienable right. Inalienable right cannot be taken away. So, um, obviously, in the West, that is very much uh, argued against. Um, there is an argument that yes, you have to be 
Article, Article 5 or Article 6 claims that you need to be you need to be acting in good faith in international society in order to have the uh, provisions of Article 4. Um, Iran doesn't agree with this. Right, so a question. Um, how many of you think that the use of nuclear weapons is legal? Three, four, five, six persons? Okay, so the rest of you is against. What is the answer? The answer is not that simple. Actually, um, it is a legal lacuna. lacuna. Uh, the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, the final court in the international system, failed to announce whether the use of nuclear weapons is legal or illegal. It sees that at certain times, in certain conditions, the use of nuclear weapons may be legal. Uh, however, in general, it should be illegal. So, I think Western Day has a pretty good uh, quote that despite all that has happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, all these 60, 70 years later, we still don't have a piece of international legislation that would say, well, it's illegal. Like you can obviously see how difficult that becomes uh, when uh, for the IEA and other uh, bodies. Right, so going up on to um, the Iran's nuclear program. Um, against uh, the knowledge of perhaps uh, many people, against uh, uh, what is most commonly mentioned in, in the media, uh, the Iranian nuclear program dates back to um, 1950s. It was basically started in a cooperation between the US and Iran. The US was very, very keen on providing nuclear technology to Iran. One of the reasons why Iran was in that geopolitically strategic point of um, typical Cold War rivalry between the USSR and the US. So um, there was a lot of a lot of that um, a lot of that cooperation. Um, the first nuclear reactor, research nuclear reactor in Tehran, was created in 19. Well, the groundwork uh, was in 1959, and if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, commissioned in 1968. In 1970s, uh, which is pretty much at the time when uh, when the NPT was out for uh, signatures, uh, the Iran. Um, accessed and signed um, the NPT from the very start. 1974, the introduction of the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran. Um, and when it comes to nuclear weapons, um, obviously at the moment we fear nuclear weapons being in the hands of irrational Islamic regime in Iran. Well, actually the first mention of nuclear weapons program in Iran was by the Shah, it was uh, Shah Mohammed Reza uh, Pahlavi, um, and it was in 1974, uh, sorry, 1974 in Paris. He very uh, quickly retracted that statement, but nonetheless, um, the, the beginnings of any nuclear weapons program are there in the 1970s. Um, in 1970s, up till 1979, there was uh, a great deal of international uh, interest in Iran when it comes to nuclear program, a great deal of uh, deals with Iran, uh, France, Germany, Canada, the UK, um, India, um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology offered uh, knowledge transfers uh, and uh, nuclear reactor operations uh, trainings. Um, but in 1979, there comes a major, major difference in, in Iran the Islamic Revolution of Iran. Uh, in January 1979, uh, Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi uh, uh, leaves Iran, and uh, in February 1979, uh, Imam Hussein Khomeini uh, arrives uh, to Tehran from Paris. 1979-1980 um, is pretty much the time of the Islamic Revolution, uh, a great difference in, uh, in, in, in the politics, foreign affairs, and the nuclear program of Iran. In 1979, partially because of international condemnation of the Iranian revolution, and partially uh, due to um, 
rational choices of Iran, the nuclear program has, uh, is suspended. It was suspended from uh, 1979, 1980 till basically mid-1980s. Um, from 1980 to 1988, we have the uh, war uh, with Iraq. Um, and here lies the answer for why Iran would want to consider nuclear weapons. In, um, in the midst of that war, uh, Iraq, uh, who eventually uh, was internationally agreed to be the aggressor, um, started using chemical weapons against the Iranians. A great deal of Iranians died, um, also partially for uh, lack of good strategic thinking on the part of Iran. But um, when, the, when Iraq started using chemical weapons on the Iranians, uh, there was basically no condemnation from the international society. Um, and at that time, uh, Imam Khomeini uh, realized, okay, well, look, uh, we attacked chemically. Uh, the international society does nothing. Uh, they don't want to condemn it. They don't want to help us. We need the ultimate deterrent. And the ultimate deterrent, obviously, is the nuclear weapon. Um, Moving on from 1980s, uh, there is a great deal of, uh, well, before, in, in the 1982, 85, there is the policy of uh, Khomeini's uh, neither East nor West foreign policy, so he wants to be independent, uh, therefore he doesn't want to cooperate with anyone, therefore the, in, uh, the program uh, stagnates. But from mid-1980s, he looks towards Pakistan. He looks towards India, he looks towards China and towards uh, the USSR and Russia for a nuclear technology. Uh, one person to mention uh, that's uh, interesting, uh, not only for Iran, but also for nuclear programs of, for instance, Libya, um, is uh, Abdul Khadir Khan, um, the father of the Pakistani uh, nuclear weapons program and the father of the Pakistani nuclear energy program. Um, Soon after he created the Pakistani program, he realized he, get, he can get more money um, doing deals on the, on the, on the black, market, black market. So that's, that's precisely what happens when it comes to Iran. Uh, most of the technology, most of the uh, centrifuge technology, most of the uranium enrichment technology comes from Abdul Khadir Khan. Um, in 2002, um, among, um, <coughs> in the midst of um, and many um, refugees. refugees from Iran, um, there is a clandestine nuclear structured, st structured nuclear weapons program that is revealed. This leads to great international condemnation, start of the uh, sanctions regimes, start of uh, obviously the uh, nuclear, Iran's nuclear weapons crisis. Um, Due to international agreements that were reached in 2003, um, Iran decides to uh, stop its structured nuclear weapons program. And I mentioned structured because some people claim there was still a clandestine weapons program. Um, and it has suspended nuclear enrichment uh, from 2003 to 2005. Uh, that was met uh, quite positively uh, by the international society, but at uh, the moment, they started enriching again in 2005, again claiming this inalienable right to, uh, to enrich. Um, again, the, the, the crisis starts. Um, a series of United Nations Security Council resolutions are imposed against Iran, um, and a great deal, obviously, of the advanced sanctions regime that hit so hard today in Iran. Um, Iranian nuclear facilities. When it comes to nuclear power reactors, uh, there's only one. Um, again, it was started in the 1970s, started by the Germans and Siemens and uh, Kraftwerk. Um, it was then stopped in 1979. However, uh, it has to be said that the Germans wanted to uh, finish and commission the nuclear uh, reactor in 1981. Uh, so they basically missed about two years, arguably. Um, it was then uh, uh, it was then left untouched for a number of years, and in mid 1980s, uh, early 1990s, the Russians started working on it. Uh, they provided uh, what is now the um, only one nuclear weapons reactor in operation: the water water uh, 
uh, energy reactor. Uh, it's a, basically a type of a, um, pressurized water reactor or light water reactor. Um, and it was commissioned in 2011. Uh, it reached a full capacity in 2012. What does it say about Iranian nuclear program? Well, it took them what, about 30 years uh, to actually build one reactor. Um, there is the Darkhoven reactor uh, that is in construction. Um, it's interesting because it's meant to be the first, well, if introduced, it's meant to be the first indigenously, indigenous, indigenously designed uh, nuclear reactor in Iran. It was meant to be introduced in 2008. Again, pretty much anything that happens with um, nuclear program of Iran, it's it's meant, it, it's meant to be done this year, but it's then delayed for another five years, and then it's delayed for another five years. So for the moment, uh, the commissioning date uh, is uh, envisioned to be 12, uh, 2016. And then we've got the nuclear research reactors, uh, the one I mentioned, the uh, Tehran uh, Nuclear Research Center. Isfahan, uh, four reactors in uh, um, operation, uh, one of them a heavy water reactor. And um, finally, Arak IR40 um, center, um, again meant to be a heavy water reactor, currently under, uh, under um, construction, and again meant to be an ind indigenously uh, created uh, heavy water reactor. Um, Iran con Iran's continued interest in heavy water reactors has um, led to a great uh, international uh, interest in there and condemnation. Uh, does anyone know why? What is it, what is it so special about the heavy water reactors um, that um, is so interesting? And uh, why is it uh, considered to be such a great threat to proliferation? Okay, it uses natural uranium. Uh, natural uranium is, uh, again, not under safeguards. Um, it's available on the open market. It doesn't require enrichment. And also, as a side effect, creates plutonium, which then can be reprocessed and used in nuclear weapons. Um, it is, heavy water reactors are much, much more efficiency, uh, much, more, much, more, much more energy efficient and uh, less costly, but are considered to be the threat. Well, is Iran a weapons state? Um, as you can see, accusations has been ongoing from basically 1984. Uh, every year, every, every two, every three years, there is someone coming up saying, okay, Iran will weaponize uh, in two years' time. Currently, well, um, Benjamin Netanyahu, the president of, uh, of uh, the prime minister of Israel, uh, claims that it uh, should be uh, crossing the threshold any time now. Um, Mayor Dagan, uh, the former chief of Mossad, claims it should be by 2015. If history of that program teaches us anything, in my opinion, is that one should never really estimate when Iran crosses the threshold. Uh, so many people wanted to do it, so many people tried, so many people failed. Uh, it's, it's extremely, extremely unsuccessful, extremely inefficient. What we actually know about uh, the Iranian nuclear program, we know that it was stopped. The structured nuclear program was stopped in 2003. Uh, we don't know whether there is a clandestine program going on. However, um, IEA, um, Mossad, CIA, uh, DIA, uh, nobody can actually indicate one single piece of evidence, irrefutable evidence, uh, for nuclear weapons program. And uh, also, very importantly, uh, it is very clear uh, that the Iranian regime has not decided on crossing the threshold. Uh, they may have decided on coming close to what we could call a nuclear latency stage, having all the technology and all the knowledge there and being able to then break out uh, very easily and quickly, but uh, the decision to cross the threshold is certainly not there. Uh, however, in 2012, there are two concerns uh, when it comes to sites in, in Iran. Uh, Parchin is the one, um, second is Fordao. Uh, Parchin is a military site. Uh, the latest uh, IEA report uh, in August um, sees, uh, basically claims that 
in the, in the period between 2003 and 2005, there was no activity there at all. But in 2012, there seems to be a cleanup activity. Um, nobody can actually still, you know, ob obviously uh, prove that it is a nuclear weapons uh, program, but nonetheless, there, there, there was a cleanup operation there. Um, and it, th that side is also associated with uh, quite infamous by now, infamous by now uh, Vyacheslav Danilenko, um, ex-USSR uh, physicist uh, that um, pioneered uh, nano-diamonds technology. Um, again, the, the, the jury is still out there when it comes to proving whether nano-diamonds can be used in nuclear weapons programs, but that's what uh, many in the international uh, society think might be uh, used in um, impulsion devices. And uh, for now, um, this is exactly the side that the, the Israelis are most uh, afraid of because it's underground and it's going further, further down underground, which means that um, even the nuclear, uh, well, the uh, super um, bunker buster bombs will not be able to, uh, to deal with that. Um, Preemptive strike, you may recognize this by now infamous picture from the United Nations General Assembly. Um, Israel is ob obviously, well, I said Israel, but I should rather quantify it. it the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, and his Defence Minister, Ehud Barak, are very, very afraid about uh, Iran crossing the, crossing the threshold. Um, are they going to cross the threshold? Um, we don't know. Um, is there going to be a, uh, an attack on Iran in 2012? Most probably not anymore. Why? Because uh, the summer is over. Uh, surgical strikes, uh, pretty, pretty much what the Iran, uh, Israel wanted to do, US potentially too, uh, require great uh, precision, obviously. And for that, you need to have uh, good atmospherical uh, conditions, um, and that is no longer there. So 2013, perhaps, but definitely not 2012, in my opinion. Um, what is it going to cause if we do strike? Is it going to be a surgical strike, what the Iranians and uh, Americans want to do, some Americans want to do? No. It's, uh, Iran doesn't have four or five nuclear, uh, nuclear sites at the moment. It has lots of them. And uh, Iranians, one could say, were very uh, clever and, uh, and basically spread the nuclear program throughout the country and actually located it quite often within uh, the civilian populated areas. So should there be a strike, there'll be a massive, massive... Um, uh, massive, massive, uh, there, there'll be a, a great deal of uh, casualties there. Um, the Osirak effect. Uh, Osirak is a nuclear weapons site in Iraq that was attacked by uh, Israel in 1981. What it created? Um, by 1981, that program was not only not structured, but it was very inefficient, it was small, um, and there was little money for that. Opposed the strike, um, from, I believe, 400,000 US dollars that was spent pre-1981, uh, it became 4 million uh, post-1981. Um, and uh, it became extremely successful, ex extremely structured, uh, potentially the same uh, thing might happen in Iran. And uh, Shayorim Shotkim doctrine for Israelis, it's actually something very, very, uh, very easy to understand. It basically means silence when shooting. Um, Israeli, Israel is a, is a nation at arms. Uh, every single citizen is uh, a member of the IDF. Um, so basically, the moment a war starts, nobody dares to uh, uh, comment. Uh, there is no critique within the country. The same thing is very, very likely to happen in Iran. It's an extremely nationalistic country. It's a country that has a great uh, history of martyrhood. So um, this is the, the, exactly the same thing that's sort of going to happen in there. One, why do, in my opinion, why, uh, why does the international society want to get rid of the nuclear weapons program in Iran? Should there be one? Well, actually, I think the actual goal is to get rid of the regime. Um, is this going to be achieved by strike? Uh, quite the opposite, I would say. Um, the the regime is going to, uh, certainly going to be strengthened. It's exactly what we saw during the Iraq-Iran war. Um, and what happens in the Gulf? Um, there's going to be a great retaliation 
um, retaliation against both the American bases there, but also uh, there's going to be quite a, a, a bigger number of attacks on mostly asymmetrical attacks on uh, um, oil and gas facilities uh, in the Gulf, something we cannot at the moment afford uh, at the, uh, um, in the state of economy that we are in at the moment. Um, sorry, but actually, the war is already happening. Why? Syria is number one. Uh, Staxnet is number two. Um, assassinations of nuclear uh, physicists in Iran is number three. Um, Hezbollah is number four. So uh, it's not an open, it's not all an all-out war, uh, but it's definitely ongoing. What happens the day after? Um, one of the reasons, one of the things that many people claim is going to be the definite um, consequence of uh, nuclearization, weaponization of Iran, is going to be the nuclear arms race in the Middle East. Um, the countries that are of, of greatest concern are um, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Turkey. Saudi Arabia, many people say, yes, it will weaponize the day after because it has had the clandestine uh, weapons programs with uh, Abdul Qadir Khan and Pakistan. Uh, there's a great deal of exchange of knowledge, a great deal of exchange of military between them. Uh, the Pakistani Air Force uh, pilots uh, fly the Saudi Arabian uh, Air Force aircraft. Uh, they have been doing so for quite some time. now. But if history again, um, okay, this is only looking at the history. The future might be different, but the history teaches us that nuclear weapons are not for sale. Uh, Pakistan, the argument is Pakistan is going to sell nuclear weapons to Iran. Well, I would say that's quite unlikely. Secondly, nuclear weapons, uh, strategic nuclear weapon, weapons are there to create an ultimate deterrent. Um, bot nuclear weapons will not create that effect. Uh, when you don't have a nuclear fuel cycle, uh, when you don't have the no knowledge and know-how, it's very unlikely for the deterrent effect to be there. Turkey, very unlikely to weaponize. Why? First of all, it's uh, part of NATO. I don't think it will, uh, it will risk getting out of it. Um, again, coming back to Saudi Arabia, it is entirely dependent on, on its security uh, from the US. So the moment it becomes a nuclear weapon state, a nuclear weapon state, it certainly loses all that security. It is a great risk, uh, both uh, regionally and internationally. Um, conventional arms race, however, is a great, great, great concern. Um, the effect that is very likely of um, very likely to happen um, the day after the Iranian nuclearization or weaponization is the extension of nuclear umbrella by either uh, the US or Pakistan. This will also create a great nuclear uh, conventional arms race. Um, missile shield systems are already put in place. Um, that will certainly cause instability in the region. Um, the new world disorder, many people say the current times that we live in are entirely different from the Cold War. They've got nothing to do with the Cold War. We cannot, uh, we cannot rely on that uh, idea that states can be deterred, and certainly Iran cannot be deterred, the argument goes, because Iran is an, ir an irrational state. Why is it an irrational state? Two days ago, there was an article posted by uh, one of the Israeli academics, uh, well, actually, pretty good academic, as, which is surprising. Um, he then said, "Well, what, how can we how can we uh, trust them? Because uh, when they when they kill people overseas, how can we trust them when they support Hezbollah? How can we trust them when they support Hamas? Well, actually, when it comes to the terrorism, when it comes to the, the, another great international concern that Iran may transfer nuclear weapons to, to terrorists, unlikely. Why? Because again, nuclear weapons are not for transfer. Secondly." Um, Pretty much up till now, uh, Iran has been supporting Hezbollah for many, many years. It has never, it has never allowed Hezbollah to attack American planes. It has never uh, equipped Hezbollah with extremely precise uh, devices. So they clearly see the red lines there. 
Uh, same thing goes for Hamas. In fact, Hamas uh, is quite detached from Iran at the moment uh, due to the situation in, uh, in Syria. Um, yeah, so that'll that be it. Uh, it was a short introduction. There's uh, um, much, much more, uh, but uh, we can do only that much within an hour. So if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer. First of all, I would say uh, there is plenty of historical evidence to uh, claim Iran is an extremely rational country. Why? Um, two examples. 1918-1988, uh, war with Iraq. Uh, what does it do? It is obviously hit by Iraq, uh, another Muslim state. Um, where does it seek weapons? Funny enough, uh, they bought weapons from Israel and the US. It's a pragmatism that is there. Uh, when, when the regime is uh, threatened, um, all the ideology, all the Islamism is out of the question. The, 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 ultimate, the ultimate concern of Iran at the moment is regime stability and they will do everything to have that in place. Um, foreign policies have been shifting and changing for years and years to ensure exactly that regime stability. Should, should Iran be stopped uh, from continuing the nuclear weapons program? Well, first of all, we don't know whether it actually the civilian program. Um, many people say yes, therefore we've got the ban on the enrichment um, because uh, people say that we can't trust Iran. Um, but as I indicated, legally this becomes extremely difficult because you do have that inalienable right. The, the only reason why Iran is prohibited at the moment from enriching is because of those six the United States, uh, United Nations Security Council resolutions, and they cite Chapter Seven powers, which means, uh, which basically uh, means that the, the UNSC sees Iranian nuclear program as a threat to international peace and security. And when when such thing happens, every single state has an obligation legally um, to comply. So, should it be stopped? In my opinion, no. Uh, there is uh, a person called um, Kenneth Waltz, um, uh, an American nuclear uh, non-proliferation uh, non -proliferation security expert uh, that has recently actually argued Iran should in fact obtain a nuclear weapon because what happens when states obtain nuclear weapons, it, in his opinion, it creates stability. Um, does it really create stability? Well, there is a bit of a paradox there because yes, it prevents major wars from happening so you don't have major wars, but it, has, it, it, it emboldens states to have sort of small-scale incursions, something we saw between uh, India and Pakistan and, uh, and the Kargil War. Um, in my opinion, Iran should not be stopped, um, and um, um, nuclear energy, civilian nuclear energy is out there for everyone. Um, what role does the appeasement um, play in the Middle Eastern conflicts? Um, what exactly would you mean by that? Yeah. Um,
again, I'd say, in my opinion, and many people would disagree. Um, yeah, in my opinion, and many people would disagree. Um, I don't believe Iran has a nuclear weapons program. I don't believe it wants to uh, uh, cross the threshold. Reaching the latency stage, yes. But having said that, we, it is argued today um, that any um, developed country um, is capable to reach that uh, latency stage within three, four years. So, um, but I think that the major problem is the, the international, uh, international societies um, dislike of the revolutionary regime in Iran. Um, and there, 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 there is a great deal of reasons for it. Um, it, is not, uh, it is not a good state, uh, it has to be said. Um, but when it comes to international security, one, has, one thing has to be, be pointed out. Iran is a country that has not invaded or attacked another country in the past 200 years, as opposed to, for instance, Iraq. Okay, so I think we should... Uh